Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Boyd, and I'm a developer advocate working uh, in our developer relations group uh, on the Google Apps Marketplace. And this is Dave Primer, and he's an engineer in our auth team. Uh, we're here today to talk about OpenID single sign-on and OAuth data access for Google Apps. Now, you may wonder why we're here. There's, there's all sorts of material about these two topics. Um, there's all sorts of confusion about these two topics, of course, as well. Uh, we're here really because we've worked with a bunch of Marketplace partners over the last couple of months to launch on the Google Apps Marketplace. And there's been all sorts of confusion about which of the flavors of OpenID and which of the flavors of OAuth they should be using for the different use cases and how users are coming into their application. So we're here to talk about that, and we're here to try to provide you some guidance on the different flavors and when to use them. We're not going to be diving deep into the protocol and, and showing you all the bits of an OAuth signature or anything like that, so don't expect that as part of this talk. Um, so as long as we're prepared with that, we'll get going. Um, you can view live notes and questions. You guys have already seen this stuff many other sessions so far, so go to Magic Wave um, on Bitly and you can ask your questions, and we'll try to leave a little bit of time at the end of the session for that, uh, although I think we're a little bit cut short on time here because the keynote ran a little bit late. So the agenda today. First of all, we want to talk about terminology. Then we want to go a little bit of history of these protocols, and then go into each of the protocols, OpenID, OAuth, and then a hybrid combination of the two, and then talk about the Google Apps Marketplace, and then the evolution of this SASE payroll application, and then the Q&A we talked about. So Sassy Payroll. Sassy Payroll is a fictitious app. The app doesn't really exist. Um, and it's for handling the payroll of small and medium-sized businesses. How many of you went to the Marketplace session that I did yesterday? OK, you probably recognize the UI. Sassy Voice, at least, was a real application that worked. Uh, this doesn't. Um, but this, our, we have a pretend company here, too, called Smart Law Firm. Smart Law Form, Firm is a company that uses Google Apps for their business. And uh, they use this SASE payroll application. And so we're going to be using these two things throughout the presentation. Terminology. First of all, we have two different main terms that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, authentication. The goal of authentication is to get secure knowledge of the identity of the user. And then we're going to talk about authorization as well and getting appropriate access to the user's resources, uh, things like with Google Apps, like calendar, docs, spreadsheets, and that sort of thing. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the history of these protocols. Well, first one here is, is back in 2005. Uh, Brad Fitzpatrick at, uh, at LiveJournal invented this thing called OpenID. And the goal was to allow you to use your OpenID account uh, to log into places, other places around the web. Uh, and it was an open protocol so that you could also use other accounts at other providers to log in at other places around the web. But then the next couple of slides here, we're going to be talking about Google's particular history with authentication and authorization protocols. So back in April of 2006, Google launched the Calendar API. This was the first Google Data API based off of the Atom Publishing Protocol that was being formed at the time. And we needed a way to authenticate users that are and authorize their data access uh, for Calendar. So if you were writing an application that used Google Calendar and wanted to manipulate a user's Google Calendar or get access to their data, you needed a way to um, you know, make sure that the user is who they say they are and tell Google that information. And so you used client login. You basically passed a username and password over to Google. We returned a token. You can use that token then to access the user's Google Calendar. Well, there's a bit of a problem with this in that many applications then are asking for people's usernames and passwords. Um, so the auth sub protocol was released shortly thereafter, in about two months afterwards. And this really solved that challenge. It basically allowed you, if you were a website, instead of asking for the user's username and password, you would redirect them over to Google. They would enter the username and password on Google's site. And again, you would get a token to access the user's data. Uh, meanwhile, you know, Google was doing these proprietary protocols, but a lot of standards were underway in development. We talked a little bit about OpenID earlier. But the OWASP standard came out uh, in December 2007, the work of a lot of people in the community to really come up with a standardized version of this web authorization scheme that OSSUB was. Um, and the idea behind this is really just, you know, you learn this technology once and you can use it with a lot of different APIs across the web. 
So the OAuth standard was, was uh, launched then, and Google went about implementing it uh, in June of 2008. Uh, so basically, the OAuth was the way to do a standardized version of what OSSUB allowed and have this web redirect flow. Uh, then OpenID launched shortly thereafter for Google consumer accounts. So if you had Gmail accounts and that sort of thing, we, we launched the OpenID protocol so that you could log in with your Google consumer account or Gmail account at many different websites uh, around the web, as long as they were what's called an OpenID relying party, and we'll get into some of that terminology. And then OpenID for Google Apps, for those of you who are here and care about Google Apps, it launched uh, in, in last year. Um, and then finally, the Google Apps Marketplace. The Google Apps Marketplace launched just a couple months ago, and it really just is a way that you can sell business applications to Google Apps customers, and it uses a lot of these different technologies, uh, but hopefully in a more user-friendly way and uh, hopefully a more developer-friendly way. So OpenID. OpenID is really for federated identity. And what do I mean by federated identity? Well, web applications called relying parties accept the assertion of identity from identity providers, such as Google and Yahoo. So if you want to go log in to one of these applications, whether it be Tungle, Sassy Payroll, Aviary, Efax, all of these services uh, are OpenID relying parties, uh, and you can log into them using your Google account. Uh, so you don't actually have to create a new account and password on each of these sites. What information do you get as an app developer, though? You get essentially this URI. It's an opaque URI, an anonymous identifier, uh, but it's static. So if, if you visit a web application today, they get that U, the UR, same URI as if you visit it six months from now. Uh, so that allows you to track users uh, over time, but it is relatively anonymous. In the case of Google Apps, it has the Google Apps domain name in it, uh, but it has this long string of numbers for the user's identity. Now, there's more information available via OpenID, and we're going to get to that uh, when we talk about some of the extensions that we support. This is kind of like the mission statement that's on the OpenID website. OpenID is a safe, faster, and easier way to log into websites. So what do we mean by that? Safe. Well, the user only enters their credentials in one place, on the website of their OpenID provider. That's obvious as to why that is safe. Um, Faster, the user is often logged into their OpenID provider, and we're going to see that shortly. So the user really just has to authorize passing their identity to a website. Um, and easier, the user no longer needs to create and maintain a bunch of different accounts. Uh, that's obviously a lot easier, because I'm sure you're all familiar with the, with the problem of namespace collisions while you go to create accounts uh, on new sites. Uh, and many of you may reuse your passwords, too, so that becomes, becomes safe as well. Discovery is a really important part of OpenID, though. You really need to be able to determine the OpenID provider for a particular user. Uh, in order to do that, there are a couple different processes. Let's go into what traditional OpenID was. Traditional OpenID, you saw a dialog box that looked like this. It asks you to enter in your OpenID, which was a URL, uh, and you would enter that in and hit sign in. Now, who actually remembered these URLs? Geeks. Geeks were really the only people that used uh, this original form of, of OpenID uh, because they're the only ones that cared to create these URLs and remember these URLs. So over time, there's been a number of, of different people getting together and do, re doing research on the user experience of OpenID. And what they came up with was a little bit better form uh, called the you know, NASCAR in the community, where you present the badges. Uh, of a lot of different providers, identity providers, on one single page. So this is the NASCAR for Tungle, and you can log in you know, via OpenID with your Google account or your LinkedIn account or your Yahoo account. Lots of different providers allowing you to log in. But this did have one important problem. Um, if you, your provider wasn't listed there, you couldn't log in with that provider. Um, so it basically was up to each of the relying parties or each web application to decide which badges to list there. I'm going to actually show you an example of an interface somewhat like this um, on ManyMoon. For those of you who aren't familiar with ManyMoon, ManyMoon is a project management app on Google Apps, uh, or that's well integrated with Google Apps. Um, but first, I'm going to show you logging in with my traditional Google account. As you saw over here, I was actually logged into Gmail already, so logged into my account. And I hit Google here. And because I'm already logged in with my email account, all I'm 
all I'm required to do really is say, yes, I will allow this website to have access to my identity. Fairly simple, a lot easier than the typical process where you would uh, create a new username and password. So now ManyMoon actually has access to my name, and I hit sign up. And I'm immediately into ManyMoon and able to create a project, uh, and this was a brand new account. So much faster, much easier than creating a new username and password, verifying that password, getting email verification, all that traditional process that you're used to on, on many websites around the web. Sorry, I tried to go to the next slide when I was in the web browser. That didn't work. But what if you want to use OpenID on your own domain? If you're a Google Apps user, you have a Google Apps domain. Uh, or if you wanted to use a different provider, let's say you wanted to use your MySpace account to log in to Tungle in this case, and, and MySpace wasn't listed there. But you don't want to have this complicated URL to remember. So the ideal user experience, in my opinion, is something like this. The website would ask you, what is your email address? And you would enter in your email address and hit log in. Now, this isn't quite anonymous as some of the initial versions of OpenID, but it does create a better user experience, in my opinion. Uh, this is actually the ideal goal of, of the folks that are working on Webfinger. Uh, it's a new up-and-coming protocol that was discussed a lot earlier this week from my reading the notes at uh, IAW uh, down in, in Mountain View. So this is actively under development, but we're not quite there yet. Now, I want to talk a little bit here about Google accounts versus Google Apps accounts. You, mentioned, you heard me mention earlier consumer accounts and Gmail accounts. They're actually distinct from Google Apps accounts. We have two different ways that we store those accounts. Uh, so you may see, actually, on many websites, uh, the ability to log in with either of them. You'll see a Google button and a Google Apps button like you do here. Uh, and you know, we've really tried with Google Apps to get somewhere between where we are today and what that ideal environment is, where you're just entering your email address. So on this case, in this uh, site, if you enter in, or if you, sorry, if you choose your Google Apps account here, you'll be prompted to enter in your email address uh, or domain name. And what this really does is allows OpenID discovery process to occur. And discovery with Google Apps domains occurs in two different ways. The first way I'm showing here is traditional OpenID discovery, where in this case, the SASE payroll application is a relying party, and it goes off to smartlawfirm.com and says, hey, who is your OpenID provider? Um, and really, you know, that transaction is great, except that many Google Apps customers don't actually host their own websites. Many Google Apps customers just want email and calendaring and docs and that sort of thing and don't have a website uh, or don't really understand how to set up an open ID uh, identity information, sorry, discovery information on their website if they do have one. So the second way helps them. Uh, you can check whether smartlawfirm.com in this case has outsourced discovery to Google. So for Google Apps, this is necessary. You have to go over from a SASE payroll, ask Google, hey, do you know who the open ID provider is for this, the smartlawfirm.com? And Google will say, yep, I'm the open ID provider, and life is golden, and users will be able to log in. Now, the format that you get for these two different types of accounts, the format of the open ID you get is a little bit different. Uh, I'm just going to show you these here so that you recognize if you're storing you know, people's open IDs in your database tables, you recognize that you know, consumer accounts will be on Google.com, uh, and Google Apps accounts will be on their own domain names. Now, Google supports a number of different extensions for open ID. Uh, these different extensions are listed here. For those of you who are already somewhat familiar with open ID, you may recognize some of them. I'm going to go into detail on just two of them. Um, and the first is Attribute Exchange. So remember earlier I talked about you just get this opaque uh, static identifier with OpenID, and it looks something like this. You know that the user is on smartlawfirm.com, but you don't actually know who they are. Well, as a web application, you want to know more information about the user, because you can create a much better user experience. You saw that with the ManyMoon demo, and it pre-filling my name and password. So in this case, to get more information, use Attribute Exchange. And Attribute Exchange, with Google at least, will provide things like the first name, last name, email address, and language of the user. 
Uh, now, Google is a, you know, a trusted identity provider when it comes to the email address. We will verify that the user's email address uh, really belongs to them. Uh, but there are some less trusted uh, identity providers, per se, that allow users to uh, actually set their email address for attribute exchange or set their name uh, and that sort of thing. So you want to actually whitelist the trusted identity providers, and you may want to take a little bit of caution on the attribute exchange attributes uh, with, the, with the other identity providers. So more information about this is actually on code.google.com in our best practices section. Um, and you know, this, is, this is really helpful to remember because that, you, know, you want to make sure that your application is securely using the email address. Uh, some applications that really, really, really want to be sure about that email address do still go through that nor the uh, you know, typical verification process where it sends an email off to the user uh, and then asks them to log in with OpenID. But how is all of this done in practice? You've heard me mention a number of different complicated terms, perhaps. Uh, you heard me talk about attribute exchange. You heard me talk about relying party. Um, it's not really hard in practice because there are a bunch of different libraries out there for you to use. I'm not going to go suggest that each of you hands, hand writes their own open ID code. Uh, first of all, it, it can be a little bit complicated uh, from the security aspects of it, and likely you'll mess up. Um, not that I don't trust all your development skills, but um, everyone messes up when they, when they try to go implement these sort of protocols, and you don't want to mess up when it's something uh, you know, as, as important as securing the identity of your users. So there's all these libraries out there. Um, these libraries you know, have been used by the community and evaluated by the community, so you want to check them out. Now, I mentioned there's those two flavors of OpenID uh, and the discovery or for Google, and the discovery process works a little bit different for the Google accounts, Gmail accounts, versus Google Apps accounts. All of these libraries support uh, Google Apps accounts and that discovery process, uh, some natively and some with some extensions uh, that are listed there that are available on code.google.com. All right, now Dave is going to come up here and talk about OAuth data access and getting access to Google Data APIs using OAuth for authorization. Thanks, Ryan. OK, so OAuth. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, some of the things that Ryan said in the beginning, that I'm going to be basically covering um, high-level use cases for OAuth, helping you decide um, what scenarios you're going to um, in, what, in which scenarios you're going to actually choose a specific type of OAuth or authorization. And um, I'm not going to go into like, the details of all the bugaboos around uh, request signing and things like that. But um, as Ryan also said, uh, client libraries are your friends here. So the most important part of uh, uh, understanding OAuth is getting a good understanding of the roles involved um, because it is an access control system. So I want to go over some terminology to begin with. Um, first, we have your standard blue cylinder. <laughs> this is a protected resource. Um, it's a calendar in this case. And the protected resource um, actually belongs to a resource owner. The resource owner is the, is the uh, person who approves access to the protected resource. And the protected resource uh, resides on a server. And uh, Oh, I wanted to back up really quickly and say that the resource owner is actually an interesting uh, role because it could be an individual, in which case the protected resource would be just a calendar, a, an individual's calendar. Um, or it could actually be a, an organization, a company like the Google Apps organization. And in that case, the protected resource would be all of the calendars in that organization. So we have the server. And the server receives an HTTP request from the client. And the client in this case is a client in the sense of an HTTP client. Sassy Payroll, the application that Ryan mentioned, might actually be a server on the internet itself um, taking requests from end users. But in the, uh, in the concepts of OAuth, it's basically a client because it's making a request. So if you learned about OAuth prior to this year, um, you probably encountered some different terms. So I'm going to try to actually update your um, understanding of the terminology in this presentation. I'm going to use the new terms. Um, Pre-2009, uh, the term consumer was used instead of client. Um, service provider is sort of broken out into um, server and protected resource now. 
and user is actually resource owner and sometimes user. And for more information on why these terms changed and uh, more explanations of the terminology, you should probably check out the authoritative, gu authoritative guide to OAuth 1.0. It's written by the author of the spec. And I also wanted to point out that the RFC that was just actually um, published in April has a pretty good explanation of the terminology. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty readable document, so I recommend that. So here are the two main components of OAuth that I'm going to be talking about today. Key management, which is the way that a client and a server establish trust, um, and access control. And access control can actually be done for an individual or for a whole group of users in a Google Apps domain. And that's, this basically breaks down to three concrete steps. There's client registration, where the developer goes to the server and does some key management, registers itself. Um, there's a resource owner grant. This has to happen before any resources can be accessed. And then the actual access of the resource by the client application. So here we have our SASE payroll app again. And uh, SASE payroll actually has a, has a cool feature that it allows the users to actually add their payroll dates to their Google Calendar. So it needs to write to the Google Calendar in order to do this. And it needs to actually get the user's permission in order to write to the Google Calendar. But, but before I show you that access um, approval step, I want to kind of basically explain what the developer of the application like SASE Payroll has to do in order to, um, to do that key management to establish that trust. So step one is actually for the developer. It's getting an OAuth key in secret. And this step is similar to a step you would do as a developer on any cloud, app, um, cloud platform such as Amazon. Um, they have a developer key, uh, Yahoo, uh, Netflix, and so on. So this is the screen actually at Google that you would see once you had approved, once you, once you had proved ownership of the um, sassyapp.com domain. You can see that I have the OAuth consumer key and secret um, circled here. These are the credentials that the client uses to identify itself to the server when it makes an OAuth request. Um, so the developer gets these credentials and uses them in their, in their application so step two, so that's step one, which is uh, key management. And step two is access control. Now, this is actually done by the resource owner, different party and at a different time. But there are two types of access control, specifically in the context of Google Apps. And I want to break that out because that can be sometimes confusing. Much of the um, documentation and introductions you'll see to OAuth cover purely the consumer use case. It was the original use case for the OAuth design. But since then, actually, a lot of the um, popularity of OAuth has been around um, using it in a business context. So the key difference here is um, whether or not the user is the resource owner. So the resource owner, in the case of an individual, is the user itself that would be using the application. But when it's a company, the resource owner is actually the domain administrator or the person who's in charge of all the data for the domain. They actually um, essentially own all of the accounts in the domain. And the users still use the applications, and they um, can control their data. And they can also control data access. But there's also a, another party that's actually making decisions on their behalf. So this is how it splits out, two-legged OAuth and three-legged OAuth. Three-legged OAuth is for the individual use case. And um, two-legged OAuth is for the business. And here's how it works in terms of authorization. Authorization for three-legged OAuth is done using a browser redirect, where users add a browser actually getting prompted to approve access. And two-legged OAuth is more of an out-of-band operation, where the request is pre-authorized by an apps administrator. And the user is not prompted when they um, choose to access the resources. So let me show you how an approval might be done in an um, apps domain uh, context. 
And later, Ryan's going to actually show you uh, the marketplace flow, which um, if you're developing for the apps marketplace, you'll see is preferable to this one. But this sort of breaks out the concrete details of the access control decision that, are, um, um, that is done by the apps administrator. So here we have the Google Apps control panel. And uh, this is a screen where you can actually um, create a, a new grant for a specific application. Here we have, already have Sassy Voice at the bottom that has access to docs and contacts. And we have fields that actually allow us to create a new grant. At the top, we have the resource owner. It's the administrator of smart law firm. And we have fields for the client and the protected resource. So the administrator would actually fill this out and enter in the consumer key that we saw in the previous uh, step that the developer did. And uh, here I have the calendar. Um, the calendar API is the protected resource. When he authorizes that, it becomes another one of the um, access control entries for the domain. So from here on out, Sassy App can actually access the calendar for all the users in that company. So that's step two, access control. And step three is actually when the um, developer chooses to access the resources. This might be when the user actually uses their application, or it could be um, you know, even when the user is not around. So I'm going to give you a demo of um, two-legged OAuth curl. And um, this is basically just a teaching aid to try to show you how the protocol works from a, from a uh, wire protocol standpoint. So I've written a little um, curl application using the uh, Google Data API's client libraries. And this application has just a few parameters. And when I execute it, um, it should give me a listing of the parameters for this uh, two-legged OAuth call. So this is essentially doing, if you use curl, it's got a URL that, you're, that it's accessing. It's got the HTTP method, which is get. And in this case, I've also included another parameter, which is ryan at smartlawfirm.com. This is the user that um, we'd like to access the calendar resources for. As you can see, the calendar URL does not have a user um, context in it, so it actually gets this from the user parameter. And then the final two are the consumer key and consumer secret. I'll highlight them here. So the consumer key and the consumer secret are those credentials that the developer obtained and that the um, administrator authorized in the second step. So let me show you what happens when this actually is sent in an HTTP request. I have here the, the actual raw re HTTP request and the beginnings of the response. And the thing that makes this OAuth makes it uh, different than just a regular HTTP request is the authorization header. Oops. See here. This is what this is the basically the header that my client library had created with the um, parameters that I provided it. And you can see there it's specified the consumer key. There's a nonce, timestamp, signature. I'm not going to go into the details of all of how these things are generated or what they mean. But that is essentially the information that the server receives that allows it to validate the credentials of the client and um, trust that the response was created by someone who they know. So the response, as you can see, that comes back from the calendar server, or I'm sorry, in this case, the contact server, is the Atom XML representation of Ryan's contacts. So that's a really simple um, HTTP request, and that's really what OAuth is. So what did we just see? We saw a authenticated HTTP request where the client has a, essentially a role account name and password. That's the consumer key and consumer secret. In addition, there's another parameter, which is the OAuth requester ID, Ryan at smartlawfirm.com. This is a Google-specific um, parameter that allows the Google Calendar server to know whose calendar that they uh, need to access. And essentially, some of the request attributes are bundled up and signed in a standard way. That's what the OAuth spec specifications uh, 
tells you how to do, which is the signing. So why would you want to use two-legged OAuth? Well, the most Im important reason is you don't want to actually prompt the users for their approval. This is common in enterprise um, software scenario where you provision an application for an entire set of users, and you know once you've installed it for them, they shouldn't have to you know click through more prompts saying yes, 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 I want to use this. It's also appropriate for server-to-server -server communication. There's no browser needed. Um, it works for um, essentially web services authentication to do um, batch processing or background tasks, and um, the main trust relationship is that the resource owner tells the server via an ACL to trust the client, and this ACL is usually stored server-side, and there's no token involved uh, to uh, transmit the credentials. So now let me show you the other style of authorization, three-legged OAuth, it, which is three-legged OAuth. And this is the one that you're probably more familiar with, the one that you've seen demoed repeatedly. In three-legged OAuth, basically what we have is a delegation by an individual to a client. Um, and it's basically the process where a user's browser is redirected to a server. The user says, yes, I allow this to happen. And in the process, a token is actually transmitted to the client that essentially encodes those, that, that permission grant. And here, I've showed you, I've shown you that um, what an OAuth token essentially looks like. This would be in the authorization header that we saw earlier. It's encoding, essentially, the permission grant. Joe gives the SASE payroll client permission to write to Joe's Google Calendar. And three-legged OAuth in the last step, where the, access, where the resources are accessed, is basically a two-legged OAuth call plus this token. So here's our SASE app payroll again, and let me show you briefly what this looks like to the end user. We can see here, this is the link at the bottom where the user would click to actually approve the, um, the access to their Google Calendar. When they click that, they're redirected to the Google server, and you can see here are three actors again. The resource owner, which in this case is Ryan at Smart Law, Smart Law Firm, the client, sassyapp.com, and the protected resource, the calendar. When they grant access to this, they're sent back to the SASE app payroll application, and it's writing entries into their calendar. So why would you want to use three-legged OAuth? Well, it's appropriate for um, the case where the individual is actually granting access to the resources. It's also interesting because the user's identity can remain opaque. The user's identity is encoded into the access token, and the client never actually has to uh, know the identity of the user. And again, the user is the resource owner and trusts the client with an access token. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. But before I go, let me briefly give you an overview of what's coming in the future. And that would be OAuth 2. And you might be asking, well, OAuth 1 is pretty young. Why would we already be doing OAuth 2? Well, um, some of the reasons are that the um, the authors of OAuth 1 wanted to make OAuth an IETF standard. So they started the process of standardizing it, and in the meantime, a bunch of new use cases were codified in a protocol named uh, OAuth Wrap. OAuth Wrap is a departure from OAuth 1 that actually requires a significant change to the protocol, so they wanted to increment the number, and Wrap then got folded into the process of IETF standardization. And what RAP actually um, allows you to do is avoid a lot of the um, request signing that you need to do with OAuth 1.0. So Facebook already has a working OAuth 2 prototype. Microsoft and Google have um, working RAP prototypes. Google intends to support OAuth 2. Um, it's not quite ready yet. It's, it's almost there, but they're still working on a few um, a few edge cases, and uh, <laughs> it's being debated right now on the IETF mailing list. And if you go to that link at the bottom of this slide, you can actually read the current spec to get a sense of the direction of OAuth 2. I think you'll find that it's going to be easier to implement. You'll have to rely less on client libraries in order to get it right. So 
Now I want to send it back to Ryan, who's going to actually show you how you can use OpenID and OAuth together to make your user's experience even more seamless. Thanks, Dave. All right, so as you mentioned, I want to talk about how you can use both of these together. As you can imagine, there are many times that you want to get access to the user's identity and you want to get access to the user's data. And you don't want to have to do these in two separate steps. This is what the hybrid OpenID and OAuth protocol is all about. So we can see here, in the case of uh, smartlawfirm.com and SASE app, so SASE app is actually asking for some information from my account. You saw earlier the email address. It was asking for my email address. It was asking for my name. But now you can see, in addition to ask, asking for my email address, it's also asking sorry, for access to my Google Calendar. Um, and it's a one-step grant here. And after that grant is given, the application not only has access to my identity, but it also has access to write to my Google Calendar. Now, the Google Apps Marketplace. Um, it sounded like only a couple of you actually went to the earlier sessions on the Google Apps Marketplace, so I'll give you a really brief intro. Basically, it's a place for you as developers to go and sell your applications to businesses. These are business-focused applications that you want to sell uh, in a marketplace format. Uh, and so when you go and you list your application on the Google Apps Marketplace, you end up creating a page that looks something like this. This is the SASE payroll. Uh, application as listed on the marketplace. And it's basically a place that Google Apps domain administrators can come and purchase your applications. Uh, and then they're managed in kind of a standardized fashion for Google Apps customers. So all the cloud applications uh, for, that a company needs to run their business are all available in one place. Uh, when you do that, then as a developer, you create this listing page. And as an administrator, you can click that Add It Now button to immediately install the application on your Google Apps domain. Now, what does this mean? Well, users is probably what you care about. It's what we care the most about. And this really makes it a lot easier for users to access your applications. Um, so many users, including myself, unfortunately, spend most of our day sitting in email. Email is kind of the center of the business universe. And you want to be able to access all your cloud applications right from within your email. So that's what we've done with these marketplace applications. At the top of email, calendar, and docs, and all the other Google apps, you'll see this more menu once you install an application. And then you can access the application directly from that more menu. It's really simple. And once we clicked on that SASE payroll in the more menu, we're immediately into the SASE payroll application. We're not prompted as a user to grant access to our identity or grant access to our data. This is all done by the domain administrator at the time that they install the application. So there's none of this. There's none of this, and it, it makes it really a much better user experience. Now, how the, does the main administrator grant the access? Well, you can see this, this uh, screen here is the second step during the install flow of a marketplace application. And there, the SASE payroll application, uh, or actually the SASE voice application, uh, forgot to swap out this screenshot, uh, but is asking for access to a particular set of data. In this case, the user provisioning API, so a list of all the users on the domain, in this case, also the Google Docs API and the Contacts API. And the application developer actually has a chance to tell the administrator why they're asking for that data, too. Uh, so the administrator can make an for informed decision on behalf of the whole organization. Uh, but then you're probably wondering, well, how do I, as an app developer, access this data? Once the administrator has installed the application and made the data available for me, how do I access it? Uh, well, Dave talked to you about two-legged OAuth. And here is actually, instead of registering a domain name and getting a consumer key in secret, as a marketplace developer, when you create your marketplace listing, uh, you actually have an option here at the bottom that says, view OAuth consumer key. And when you do that, you get a consumer key and secret for your application. And that consumer key and secret can then be used to access all of the data that was granted to you by domain administrators. So as an application, you can then use that consumer key and secret to identify your application and access the data for each of the users on the domains which have installed the app uh, and the domain administrators have granted access. Much simpler. And now I just kind of want to go through like a summary of, of the different protocols that we've talked about today before going into uh, our, our sassy payroll kind of mysterious timeline here. Uh, so summary of the protocols. 
Client login uh, was the original protocol we talked about with Google Calendar. You don't want to use this for, for new applications. Uh, you don't want to get the user's username and password. OSUB uh, was kind of the precursor at Google, at least, to, to the OAuth protocol. You don't really want to use that for new applications. Then you have three-legged OAuth, which what you, you use that to get access for individual users' data. Uh, and the, the, user, it, the individual user is the resource owner, and they're authorizing access to that data. Two-legged OAuth, you want to get access to a whole company's data or domain's data. You can use two-legged OAuth to do that, and the administrator is granting the access. And then when we go back to the, the first section of this presentation on identity, open ID, vanilla open ID, you can use to get access to a user's identity and with attribute exchange information, their name and email address. And that can be used as vanilla open ID for Gmail accounts. For Google Apps accounts, you have to do open ID with the Google Apps discovery extensions. And again, there's libraries available for that, but provides the identity of Google Apps users. And then finally, the open ID and OAuth hybrid that I talked about allows users visiting your web application directly to provide access to their identity and their data all in one step. Uh, and this really allows you to onboard new users much faster than you would be able to with these other protocols. Now I really want to show you the evolution of how all these technologies take place in this fictitious app, uh, Sassy Payroll. So back when, uh, Sassy Payroll uh, ex has existed for a long period of time, and they have a user's table in their database that looks something like this. There's an email address, and then there's a password. Hopefully it's a hash of a password. Uh, and they have that information stored in their database. And every user that comes to the application needs to create an account. And we're going to actually show you that user experience here with a quick video. So I, as a new user, go to the Sassy Payroll application. I say, I don't have an account. I want to create one. Fill in my name, fill in my email address, fill in a password, make a quick typo, correct it, hit sign in. I'm then told I need to confirm my account, and I hop over to email, click on a link, um, and this is, this is a little bit sped up over normal, but I'm then logged in and can see my payroll information. So then the Sassy payroll application, uh, you know, all along has been trying to figure out different ways to provide access to the data about when users get paid. Uh, their customers have really been requesting that they use Google Calendar, and they want access uh, to their upcoming payroll dates on their Google Calendar, so that it's just a lot easier for them to find out when they're going to get paid. Uh, so when, when Google launched the Google Calendar API and then launched after that the OSSEB awesome protocol for authorization, they implemented this. And their users table in their database basically stores that token that they get from OSSEB. Awesome. And this token allows them to access the user's Google Calendar and input uh, or update their calendar with their next upcoming payroll dates. And here is the user experience for that. So they're in the Sassy Payroll application already. They've already logged in. They click a button that says, add dates to your Google Calendar. They go to the OSSEB awesome page, and they grant access to their calendar. And now their payroll dates are added to their calendar. Uh, and you can see here, we go over to Gmail and go to Calendar, and you can see the payroll dates. Uh, you know, much, help, much more helpful way of knowing when your upcoming pay dates are than actually going into your payroll application to find out that information. So now, um, you know, they've, they've had a lot of Google customers, a lot of Google Apps customers, and they didn't want to have to create new accounts in order to access the Sassy Payroll application. They didn't want to have to come up with a new password. They didn't want to confirm that email that we talked about. So when Google launched OpenID for Google Apps, they said, we want to take advantage of that. We want to allow users to log in with their existing accounts. So their users table and their database had to grow a little bit to store these open IDs. So we can see Jane at goo.com has an open ID in this table and does not have a password, because Sassy Payroll doesn't need to know uh, Jane's password, because Sassy Payroll can rely upon Google to assert that identity. Uh, so they store the open ID. This user still has, has granted access to their calendar, so they again have that auth sub token there. And here's the user experience for that. So on the front page of the Sassy Payroll, they can log in with their account. They enter in their email address or their Google Apps account. It parses across the domain name, and then they grant access to uh, 
uh, sassy voice to have access to their identity. And now their information is pre-filled. Their name and their email address is already there, uh, and they never had to create a new username and password. Again, we'll go through the auth subflow where you click and grant access to calendar. And now not only does Sassy Payroll have access to their identity, but also access to their Google Calendar to display the upcoming payroll dates. Now, you, you saw those two separate access grants. Uh, the first access grant was the user granting access to the Sassy Payroll application to know their identity, to know who they are. Uh, the second access grant was them granting access to their Google Calendar. Well, we want to combine these together, and we talked about the hybrid OpenID and OAuth protocol. So the SASE payroll folks, when we released that, implemented that protocol. Uh, but there's one key difference here: is previously they were getting access to users' data via OSUB. Now they're getting access to the users' data via OAuth. It's a little bit of a different protocol uh, and has a little more information. So we can see the changes to our database table here. Uh, we added a type column to indicate the type of the token that we have, whether it is a OSUB sub token or a three-legged OAuth token. And then we added a secret column, which is necessary for uh, three-legged OAuth, because three-legged OAuth, in addition to having a token, has a token secret. So we need to store that information. And again, I want to show you the user experience for this flow of the hybrid onboarding. Again, it's much more improved over the previous flow. We go in and we log in with our account. And now you can see, like uh, you know, we saw in previous screenshots, we're being accessed for the calendar and their identity. So we're in SASE Payroll. It knows my identity. And it already is having dates added to your Google Calendar. There's no need for that second uh, grant to happen by the end user. Of course, then in March of this year, we launched the Google Apps Marketplace. And the Google Apps Marketplace is a place for businesses to buy applications for their entire company. Well, instead of having individual users coming into the SASE payroll application in small bunches, they can now buy the SASE payroll application for the entire company of a lot of users at once. So in this case here, you see that a number of users are, are added to the database table. Each of them have their open ID because they've logged into the application. And uh, we have this type column here. The type column here has one additional value that we haven't seen before, and it's 2LL. So these users are actually having, uh, sorry, their, their data access has been granted by their domain administrator when they installed the application. So we know that it's a two-legged OAuth request uh, then since you know, Dave talked about that. And for the two-legged OAuth request, uh, in addition to the, the three-legged OAuth request, the SASE payroll application needs to identify itself. It needs to say, you know, here's my consumer key and you know, I have my consumer secret and I'm identifying myself uh, to Google and uh, I'm then able to access these users all without having a token or a token secret. I don't need to have those for individual users because the domain administrator has granted access on my behalf. Now, I should stay here, say here, you want to store that consumer key and secret securely somewhere. Uh, your database table isn't the right place for it here, especially because it's not different for any of these users. You want to store it securely on your server somewhere else. So I'll show you what the user experience is for the Google Apps Marketplace. Again, much more improved for the individual end users. So first of all, we'll show the domain administrator experience. They click the Add It Now button, and they say, I'm smartlawfirm.com. <coughs> they hit Install, uh, and they go in, and they grant the terms of service, which is a very simple terms of service. They grant access to the calendar data in this case. And I forgot to use SSL in this, this mock, sorry. <laughs> and then they enable the application. The admin at, at uh, Smart Law Firm enables the application for the entire company. Now let's show what each individual end user experiences. They go into their email where they are every day, and they click on the universal navigation link for the SASE payroll application. And once they click on that, they're immediately into the SASE payroll application. It knows who they are. They haven't had to you know, grant access specifically because their administrator has done that. And you can also see that the dates are already being added to their calendar. All of this happened without the individual end user having to do the grants because the domain administrator is the resource owner and has granted access for that. So you can see here in the evolution of the SASE payroll application how much easier it has gotten 
for end users and how much easier it's gotten for domain administrators to not have to deal with the questions from the end users as to what you know, data they can grant access to and that sort of thing. The administrator owns the data. They can decide what access to grant, and then it's a much easier process. So improved user experience, much easier onboarding for users. Access is granted by the appropriate resource owners. And then with the marketplace, for those of you who don't know, you have access to over 2 million businesses that are running Google Apps. There are 25 million users on those <coughs> businesses. We're adding about 3,000 new businesses every day to Google Apps, so it's a great place to uh, list and sell your web application. Uh, there is one little hazard to this, as you saw with the user table you know, expanding over and over again, um, is that there's multiple code paths. You as a developer are probably a little concerned about this. You have different ways to get access to a user's data and to get access to their identity, uh, and you have multiple code paths. Um, well, sometimes uh, we developers just kind of have to deal with those sort of things in order to make the user experience much better. So resources. I want to give you a list of some resources that you can use uh, to follow up on some of these things. The first resource here is for the Google Apps Marketplace. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, that's kind of some technical documentation and business documentation on the Google Apps Marketplace. And then we have some technical docs on Google Apps, on OpenID and OAuth. And then finally, something we didn't actually get a chance to talk with you about today, the OAuth Playground. So Dave demoed uh, using two-legged OAuth and using his command line application to perform two-legged OAuth requests. There's a great tool out there called the OAuth Playground that does similar things for three-legged OAuth, and it's all a web-based tool. You guys should check that out. And now we're going to go into our question and answer period, and as a reminder, you can go to bit.ly slash magic wave to ask any questions you might have. And we're going to be switching our projector over here uh, to this other computer with the questions. Go ahead. I'll let you take the first one here, Dave. All right. So the first question is, um, is about the Google Apps control panel and if there's any way to actually control um, OAuth tokens from the control panel. Force expires, force expiration, and so on. So, the question here is about whether or not there's administrator control over the individual user grants in an app's domain. So, a Google Apps user can still do the three-legged OAuth dance, as Ryan showed you. Um, they're not restricted to just using two-legged OAuth just because they're in a Google Apps domain. So, they could have um, actually tokens that have been granted to client applications. So, the question is whether or not an app's administrator can actually control those tokens. And currently, they cannot do that in the control panel. Um, it's a great suggestion, and we would, um, we would love to be able to provide this sort of um, capability. One of the things that we've, one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten from administrators when we first showed them the, the marketplace is that they'd actually like to be able to possibly turn off three-legged OAuth grants for all of their users globally. So they could only be the, they could be the only ones that are actually granting access to their users, and the users couldn't actually grant um, by themselves. So I'll take the next one then. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, what about OAuth? Uh, OAuthing the Android phones. Uh, there's, you can definitely, as an application developer for Android, uh, use OAuth for getting access to a user's data from from an Android device. Uh, I actually did a, a session at Google I.O. last year, uh, which was mobile social, something like that. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube. And as part of that, I actually wrote an Android app uh, that opened up OAuth in a web browser, allowed granting access. The trick here is you need a, a URL. Well, in, in the version of OAuth that I used at the time, you needed a URL uh, to redirect back to once the access was granted in the web browser. The nice thing about Android is they actually allow you to register protocol handlers. So I registered a particular protocol that went back into my application with that token. There is a new version of uh, OAuth uh, that allows you to do both desktop applications, mobile applications, uh, and also things like you know, embedded devices and all, where uh, you don't require that redirect. So you can explore using that as well. Uh, and why don't we take the question that's in the audience here? I have two questions. Um, one is about the OpenID libraries that you mentioned in the streams. Um, could you comment anything on the Python libraries, if there's any? Sure. Uh, I can comment, but it's not going to be a comment that you like. Um, 
the, you know, we list a number of different libraries there for many languages. Python was, was noticeably excluded. Uh, there is a Python library for OpenID, if you're trying to do vanilla OpenID accounts. No one has, has written the uh, Google <coughs> Apps discovery extensions for that Python library yet. Uh, it's a Jan Rain library, very similar to the, the PHP and Ruby libraries, but my understanding is it's not quite as extensible. Um, so if you want to take that on, go for it. Uh, I mentioned uh, about not writing your own OpenID code. Sure. Uh, feel free to, to ping us and let us know if, if okay. you do write that, though, and uh, we're happy to do a little bit of review on it and, and get some other people to, to review it, because uh, there is obviously security concerns there. But no, I'm not aware of a Python library right now that supports the Google Apps extensions. Um, I, I did mention the word Jan Rain there. Jan Rain also does have commercial products called RPX. Uh, and there are some other providers that have commercial products for these sort of things, too, that provide very simple REST APIs to perform mm -hmm. OpenID. Uh, and they do have libraries available in, in Python. Okay. The second question was related to Opal OAuth and uh, Google Data Clients and the APIs. There's, there's some confusion there as to OAuth not retrieving data for all the APIs. You, you need a particular version of GData Clients. Um, is that thing going to be sorted out? or? So, I mean, I think like a lot of our documentation, unfortunately, still refers to both client login and OSUB. We need to update our documentation. Um, the, the, the perfect place for us to do that, and, and when I say documentation, I also mean the client libraries that we, we support. And the perfect time for us to do that is when this OAuth wrap comes out, because OAuth wrap makes the protocol a lot easier, uh, both to explain uh, and also to implement. And uh, it basically goes down to, to not having signatures anymore, and it, it operates very similarly to the OSA protocol. Um, so I think at that time, we'll, we'll be going through and updating. But if you have particular libraries or whatever, come see me afterwards, and, and we'll talk about them. There may be ways to do it. I think internally, we've done some samples and all uh, that use a lot of these libraries that, that aren't quite published yet, but we're going to be you know, coming out with those soon. Thank you. Thanks. So let me take one more question from, from moderator before we, we jump into the question from the audience. Um, are there any plans to support OAuth for GTOC protocol, XMPP, and the GTOC client? Uh, the short answer is no, there are no direct plans. Um, we did actually extend OAuth support to IMAP and SMTP, two you know, native protocols uh, for email communication. And uh, you know, so I can see it as quite possible that we would extend it for XMPP, uh, but we don't have any direct plans right now. Next. Go ahead. So it looks like a server has to maintain a uh, secret. Um, you know, if you're running a service, you have to do that server side. So what can you tell us about how Google maintains their secrets and how they re what any recommendations they would have for how customers should you know keep this secret secret, both in the general case and maybe for um, App Engine. Yeah, so um, the, in, the key management that I demoed was um, symmetric key HMAC secrets. So that means you have a secret essentially on the client somewhere and one on the server, and both are needed in order to um, make a request. At Google, we actually store secrets in an internal system that um, is <laughs> heavily guarded, and uh, it actually is available to a number of our servers so that we actually can um, centralize the key management, um, allows us to look up keys and verify them based on the, how the client identifies themselves. Um, you can find some examples of this actually in the Shindig libraries, I think. Um, they have some um, built-in uh, key management systems for, for OAuth because there actually is an OAuth proxy built into the Shindig uh, product that allows it to actually make, act as a client and make outbound requests and accept incoming requests. Um, and then as far as the client goes, the client actually is a really important um, thing to remember. Basically, we demoed um, HMAC secrets that are stored on the client, but in this case, we're not talking about installed software clients that reside on a person's computer. We're talking about hosted applications where a, a company is actually in charge of those secrets and they're protected on their servers. Um, for the case of an installed client, an embedded client or something like that, you don't actually want to use HMAC because it can trivially be hacked and, and your secret can actually be exposed. As if you're an application developer and you store your consumer key and secret in an application you distribute to your users, as soon as that's hacked, every single one of the companies that has been granted access to that key can then, as, as now had their data exposed.
through you. So it's an extremely important uh, <laughs> password to protect. Okay. What, if I'm run, your what if I'm running a service on um, Google App Engine? Yep. And I want to play with this, and it looks like I'm going to have to keep a secret. Well, actually, there's a couple options there. You can just act as if App Engine is a pure hosting platform and do all of the OAuth stuff that you would normally do on your own third party server. But App Engine actually has the ability to make requests and use the OAuth proxy that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So you can actually um, just identify your application. It, it, it knows who you are because you're, you're running on Google software. It finds the keys that it needs in order to sign your requests and signs on your behalf and manages the keys for you. Okay. That's great. Thanks. All right. Okay, take the next question here. Uh, interested in knowing the current security concerns with OpenID. Uh, there aren't, aren't too many of them. I don't know if you guys recently saw the, um, the US government actually started accepting OpenIDs on some of their websites. And there was a lot of work that was done uh, in order to, to validate the security of OpenID in that process. Um, of course, this, you know, this still depends on, on who the identity provider is and, and what OpenID requests they're approving and how they're improving it. Um, so for Google, we actually support uh, one extension that you probably saw on the slide earlier called PAPE, the Provider Auth Policy Extension, that actually allows you as a app developer to make things a little bit more secure. And basically what this means is, in the case of that payroll application, for instance, uh, you want to make sure that the user is still behind the keyboard uh, when the user goes to log in. They didn't walk away from their desk and, and their... Uh, coworker is trying to evilly look up their payroll or something like that. Um, and so you can do that by basically sending, adding in a paper request to say, hey, I want to make sure that uh, this user has actually logged in recently. And if not, prompt the user to log in again. And Google will actually do that prompting on behalf of the application to, to make it a little bit more secure. Um, and so there are plenty of other things that are going on, but uh, that's, that's the one thing I'd, I'd give as an advice uh, on, on terms of security. Um, next, thing, next thing was about OAuth integration to the Android SDK. Um, there's, there's no plans that I'm aware of, but uh, you guys can, can certainly uh, follow up with the Android team about that. They would probably be the most knowledgeable. Yeah, you've been waiting. <laughs> Go ahead. What's that? I'm, th I'm thinking of some environments oh, sorry, where uh, the user doesn't have good control of the browser or of the desktop like a kiosk. Um, how do you deal with uh, OpenID sign out in those situations? That's a good question. Uh, everyone keeps asking the, us about that, especially with regards to marketplace applications, is kind of having single sign out for OpenID. There, there's no real such protocol yet. Um, it's something that I definitely like to see happen in the standards community, uh, coming up with a good protocol for OpenID and single sign out, and then I'd love to see us implement it, but there's, there's no real good. Uh, use there. At, at this point, the user would have to sign out of their Google account in addition to signing out of any applications that they've logged into. Do you see Google maybe driving some of those, proposing some standards? Chris is uh, turning his head and looking to the back of the room. Uh, I could see that happening, yes. How's that? Um, <laughs> I don't have any specific inf information on it, but it is something that you know, we've been begging for internally to, to some of the engineers. Uh, that are, are more involved in the standards process. Um, and so I hope that we do that, and uh, I'll take that as another vote uh, for that to happen. Let me answer one more question here from... Uh, we have a, one more live. You can ask the live. Uh, yeah, I, I, I go, go for the it. live one. Go ahead. Uh, so we have Google in, installed at our college, mm -hmm. and so we have 3,000 or so users. I like the idea of... A, installing the app within the, the user interface. Is there a way to restrict that to subgroups? Because we have students, staff, and faculty, and we might want to have applications running just for subgroups within that uh, that are only visible there? Uh, not at this point. Uh, when you install an app from the marketplace, it is available to everyone in the domain. Uh, a lot of the applications that are on the marketplace do actually provide interfaces in that application to restrict access to it. Uh, so, for instance, the uh, Concur expense reporting product uh, prompts you during the install process, would you like to allow anyone in, or would you like to allow a named list of users in? And they, they allow you to, to select from users in your domain uh, that you'd allow, you want to allow access to. 
Um, this is something we're definitely interested in doing for the marketplace to, to restrict it at our level, uh, but definitely look at whatever application that you're, you're looking at and see if they have a way to do it. Uh, right now, it would still be in the navigation for everyone in the, in the company, but uh, some of those applications might do restrictions. Thanks. Uh, so the, the next question here on moderator uh, has a little bit of messed up problem with some URL encoding here, but I'll try to read in between the percent 20s. Um, <laughs> can you also cover app engines, create, federate, login URL, documented, or not, is, it is not documented except in the Java docs. This seems like the optimal way for Google Apps integration in App Engine. Uh, so basically, we're, we're, we're definitely looking at ways to make the App Engine process easier. Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, our team hasn't sat down and written that Python code that someone was asking for earlier, because we're, we're trying, you know, most of the requests we've gotten for Python are actually from App Engine users, and we're trying to concentrate our energies on making it a lot easier in App Engine. So, uh, you, you guys saw it already in the Java docs. You should see something uh, you know, more formal out there uh, that makes, makes this process of OpenID much easier. Um, and actually, there's a comment on here. Hey, Ryan. So, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Wesley Chun. I work in developer relations for the App Engine team. And there is no equivalent create federated login URL. However, the create login URL uh, f uh, function will, or method has the ability for you to pass in a federated identity. So we don't have two functions. One is, you know, one's the vanilla one, one's the federated one. They're both combined together into one single method. If you have any other questions, just uh, come find me afterwards. Okay, so just going through the moderator thing, if there's not a, oh, actually there's an in-person question here, if you want to go. Yeah, so um, I'm, oh, I just want to extend the questions about Android uh, from other people. So, so you mentioned that as the um, OAuth is not provided in SDK, right? So, and you also mentioned that there are other libraries possible. So can you talk about which one you would recommend and for, for accessing Google as well as maybe Facebook or anything like that? Uh, I mean, so the, the work that I had done was with three-legged OAuth um, in, inside a mobile device. So it would actually open up the web browser from the application and the user would grant access in the web browser and then be redirected back to the web application using one of those registered protocol handlers. Um, that is able to be done with the Java uh, OAuth libraries, just kind of out of the box. You can do that with the Java OAuth libraries. And I was doing it at the time with, with Open Social, so you could access you know, users' social graph and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not actually sure with regards to Facebook what libraries are, are available for that. Um, but uh, you can definitely use OAuth. I mean, they support, Facebook now supports OAuth 2, but I just really haven't dived into whether the libraries that, that I've used before with Android will work with that. Um, I, if I'm an OpenID provider, can I use the directory to authenticate to my Google Apps? Well, um, you can actually use your directory to authenticate to Google Apps, and that brings up an, another usage of the word single sign-on in some of our docs. Um, Google is actually can be a SAML relying party. Uh, SAML is a protocol for doing single sign-on. In this case, it's happening in the other direction. Uh, so you as a, as a company have something that runs on your servers that basically looks at your directory um, and manages the authentication of users. And Google just relies upon you to uh, assert the identity of your users. And so yes, you can use your internal directory. Uh, it gets a little complicated, again, because the, the terms both use sing, uh, single sign-on in our documentation. Uh, if you are installing an application from the marketplace, your next best question is probably, can you use that application still, even though that your users are coming from the directory? And yes, you can. Uh, so the application will rely upon Google to the assert the identity of the user. And then Google will, in turn, rely upon the uh, Google Apps identity or SAML provider to then assert the identity to Google, and it does this whole big round trip. But um, you can ask me uh, in office hours or out in the sandbox or after the session if you have any more, uh, or you need any more details on that. I think our, our best uh, KISS hands-on implementation example. Well, um, we have some Hello World examples for the marketplace that handle the two-legged OAuth scenario uh, and the OpenID scenario pretty well in a, in a fairly simplistic fashion for PHP and Java. Um, 
there is another application which you saw me accidentally show up on the screen here of, of Sassy Voice, which we wrote for another session, uh, which is a little bit more expanded example, uh, but exa an example of a real web application that we're looking to open source after I.O., uh, after we get a little bit of sleep. Uh, do you have any other ideas, Dave? Well, I think that there's a, there's a, a library that we just, or an application that we just released uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool to investigate the Buzz API. It's called Aura Curl, which works with any um, OAuth-enabled endpoint. That's actually a fairly small set of code. I think it's only probably only a couple hundred lines of code to look at the whole thing um, to get a sense of how it's doing it, and it's actually doing three-legged OAuth. In addition to that, I would say, if you really want to keep it simple, just focus on the two-legged OAuth use case just to understand exactly what is going on in a two-legged OAuth request. And don't get caught up in like the token here, token there, you know, yeah. all the, the whole dance, because that can actually get kind of confusing. There's quite a few HTTP um, re requests and redirects involved in OAuth, in three-legged OAuth. And if you just concentrate on two-legged and learn that, that's sort of the basics. Definitely, and, uh, and then and jump over to that OAuth playground when you when you go to try to figure out three-legged OAuth. Yeah. Uh, that explains a lot of, of that process and how it works once you have a little bit of knowledge about the, the keys and secrets and stuff. I think we need to right. stop questions here, actually, uh, because we're, we're running a little bit uh, close to the time when the next presenters need to come up. Uh, but thank you very much for coming by, and feel free to ask us uh, any questions you have in the sandbox. Or... Thanks.